Hi, I'm Lee, and this is A Memory of Malice. Hey there, loves. Today's case is really well known in Arizona, but I'm not sure if the rest of the U.S. is familiar with it. I'm covering the murder of 13-year-old Christy Ann Fornoff. This happened in the very same town I live in, and it was a big deal. There are definitely some warnings before we get into the case. This case centers on the rape and murder of a child, for starters. Also, there's mention of vomit and vomiting in this case, so if you're an emetophobe, this is probably not the case for you. Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you again another time. But let's get into it. Christy Ann Fornoff was born on May 4, 1971 to proud parents Roger and Carol Fornoff. She grew up in a large family. My sources were contradictory over whether she was one of seven or eight children, but the family was a loving one by all counts. Christy was a go-getter, an achiever. She had just joined a new school, Connolly Middle School. She had a goal of getting into Palm Line the next year, and she was practicing every day with a neighbor. I can't tell you how palm line differs from cheerleading, but either way, she was working really hard at it. Her mother, Carol, said that Christy wanted to be a star and that she wanted to be a model. Looking at her photo, I'm sure she would have grown up to be a beautiful woman, both inside and out. She would never get the chance. It was sweltering when Christy arrived at the Rock Point Apartments on May 9, 1984. By 10 a.m., the temperature gauges read 92 degrees Fahrenheit, and the day would only get hotter. I'm sure Christy would rather have been inside in the air conditioning, but she had a job to do. She delivered papers for the Phoenix Gazette, and on this Wednesday, she was collecting her customers' subscription fees. Christy wasn't alone, though. Her mother, Carol Fornoff, had come with her to watch over her that day. She walked the family dog and followed her daughter as Christy rode her younger brother's bike from apartment building to apartment building. The Rock Point Apartments were multiple apartment buildings arranged around a courtyard area. So Christy and her mother would visit her customers, go to the next building, and visit those customers. At one point, a tenant stopped Carol to compliment their dog, triggering a conversation. Eager to be going, Christy told her mom that she was going to visit the couple around the corner. Carol agreed to let her go ahead because it wasn't far. Carol finished her quick conversation and went to follow her daughter, only to see a terrifying image. The bike Christy had been riding was abandoned on the sidewalk in front of the apartments but she was nowhere to be seen. Even more concerning, Christy's collection book was found abandoned near a fence as well. Christy and Fornoff had vanished. The police didn't delay their response to the apartment complex, but they were limited as to what they could do. They didn't have probable cause to do a search of the apartments, so they could only search those that the owners gave them permission to search. Christie's father, Roger Fornoff, quickly arrived and began knocking on doors himself. He wasn't alone in this effort. Others joined in his search, spurred to assist the panicked parent. And though they searched as many apartments as they could, they didn't find Christie. The day turned to night, night turned to morning, and still, the searches continued. But with little evidence to go on, there was nothing much the police could do. Meanwhile, the case had become a media sensation. Parents all across the country were in a state of panic. In 1984, it was common practice for children to deliver newspapers and collect money from customers. The thought that this child disappeared on her route, with her mother right behind her, was terrifying. It was becoming clear that newspaper delivery was a dangerous job for children. It's a dangerous job, full stop. Adult newspaper carriers today are often assaulted, and many have been murdered during the course of their job. 
But according to the Columbia Journalism Review, at least 12 child newspaper carriers were abducted, sexually abused, or killed between 1970 and 1993. They further stated that 1970 was just the first year they collected data. It's easy to see why these children were targets. They would take the same or similar routes each day, making it easy to learn their habits. Add in the fact that they would often approach households to collect payment, and it's a recipe for disaster. But most parents weren't aware of the danger then. But on May 9th, Christy was missing, and the police had hit a dead end. A short time before 5.50 a.m. on the morning of Friday, May 11th, a tenant named Cap went to Rock Point Apartments' dumpster to dispose of his trash. As he approached, he saw the apartment's handyman, Donald Beatty, standing behind the dumpster. He was probably confused as to why Beatty would be standing there. Usually, people empty big dumpsters like those from the front, but that's a wild supposition on my part. Either way, he rounded the dumpster and was met with a startling scene. 29-year-old Beatty was standing over a small, shrouded body. The body was wrapped in a sheet, but it was clear what it was. Beatty told Cap that he had found it and that he'd already called the police. Strangely, Cap didn't seem too stressed about having just stumbled upon a body. It's possibly just my source, but it says... Cap observed the body, spoke with Beatty for a few minutes, and then returned to his apartment. That seems like a shockingly blasé reaction to finding a dead body. I've gone off topic, sorry. The police received a call from Beatty and rushed out to the apartment complex. Their worst fears were soon confirmed. The body was that of 13-year-old Christy Ann Fornoff. The police did a thorough job of investigating this case. Christie's autopsy showed clear evidence that she had been sexually assaulted. Unfortunately, DNA was still a few years away at this point. Christie was murdered in 1984, but the first DNA conviction took place in the UK in 1986, while the first US conviction took place in Florida in 1987. Police would have to rely on other evidence. I'm about to be very frank about Christie's cause of death and sexual assault. If you need to, please skip ahead to the timestamp in the description if you're listening via podcast, or the one shown on your screen if you're watching via YouTube. Her autopsy also showed she had suffocated in some way. Suffocation is a rather wishy-washy term when it comes to cause of death. All it really means is that you died from a lack of oxygen but it doesn't really give a lot of detail as to how that death occurred. However, vomit was found on her body, and it's believed that she choked to death on her own vomit while her mouth was obstructed. The assault on Christy had happened either at the time of death or just after. I won't elaborate on that, I feel that's clear enough. Multiple hairs and fibers were found on Christy's body. A few hairs were male pubic hairs, but other hairs were more unusual. They were ferret hairs. The Fornoffs didn't own a ferret, so it must have come from somewhere else. Ferrets had been experiencing a boost in popularity since the release of The Beastmaster in 1982, but they were still rather uncommon pets at the time, so it's not like she could have picked up that hair just anywhere. It narrowed the search a bit. It really wasn't hard for the police to zero in on a suspect in this case. Donald Edward Beatty had raised eyebrows since the beginning of the investigation, back when Christie had just been missing. When Roger Fornoff came to the Rock Point Apartments to search, Donald joined him. Roger was left with the certainty that Don Beatty was involved in his daughter's disappearance. That same evening, Donald was interviewed by the local media in his apartment and even the cameraman said he made him feel uncomfortable. He certainly didn't help his case by turning up at Christie's funeral. Roger told a family friend, Don't move, I'm going to show you the killer, and pointed to Beatty as he approached the sanctuary at the front of the church. 
Beatty even signed Christie's funeral book. Police questioned Cap, the tenant who had seen Beatty standing over Christie's body, and they began to notice inconsistencies. When Cap saw him that morning, Beatty told him that he'd already called the police. Beatty's call had come in at 5.52 a.m. that morning, according to call logs. But when questioned, Cap told police that he'd returned to his apartment around 5.50 a.m. There's no way there would be that much difference in the time. Remember, this was the 80s. Beatty would have had to find Christie's body, go to the nearest landline telephone, call the police, return to the body and be seen by Cap, and converse with him for a short while before he left. Also, the police arrived very quickly after receiving the call. If he'd called when he said he did, they probably would have been there when Cap was still talking to him. There was more to be learned from witnesses. When police arrived, Christie's body was clearly visible around the edge of the dumpster. But Cap hadn't been able to see Christie until he'd gone around it. Another witness, named Jark, confirmed that he'd driven in front of the dumpster at 4.50 a.m., and there wasn't a visible body. Beatty was questioned, and he maintained his innocence. He said he was with another tenant at the time Christie had disappeared, and he said that another tenant had seen them together. But both of these tenants denied that he was with them. Nevertheless, he stuck with his story. He told the news. If anybody out there finds a body and they're going to have to go through the same thing I'm going through, well, I feel sorry for that person. Police had enough to get a warrant to search Donald Beatty's apartment, and they found a lot. Forensic analysts collected samples of all the fibers in the house and collected every hair they could find. And though the investigators didn't find evidence that Beatty owned a ferret, they found something more damning, some vomit in his closet. Analysts took all this evidence back to their labs for, well, analysis, and they found compelling evidence. Fibers taken from both a blanket and towel of Beatty's match those fibers found on Christie's body. Well, as closely as fiber evidence can match, but that's a whole other kettle of fish. Christie's hair was found in his apartment, in his bedroom, bathroom, couch, and on the closet floor. The pubic hairs found on Christie's body were a match to Beatty's. They also found other hairs on the closet floor. Ferret hairs. Believe it or not, the ferret conundrum has a simple answer. The tenant who lived in Beatty's apartment before he did owned a ferret and kept it in the closet. Hopefully not all the time. Either way, it tied Christy to Beatty's apartment. The vomit was also analyzed and found to match the vomit they found on Christy's body. I'm guessing this was done through some sort of chemical analysis, but nothing I read or watched covered it. This was already enough evidence for the police to arrest Donald Beatty for the murder of Christiane Fornoff, but they also found out one more thing. The night Christie disappeared, Beatty tried to get one of his friends to lend him his car. Police assumed that this was an attempt to move Christie's body. Unfortunately for Beatty, his friend didn't let him use his car, and he was left to come up with Plan B. Beatty was arrested on May 21st, 1984, and taken to the Maricopa County Jail to await his trial. Beatty's trial began that same year. Shockingly, it ended in a hung jury. Two jurors out of ten had voted not guilty. Undeterred, the prosecution immediately refiled and brought Beatty to trial again in 1985. Two days after Beatty's trial began in the state courthouse, a psychiatrist by the name of George O'Connor also visited the courthouse. He was testifying in another trial, but while he was there, he got pulled into a conversation with the detention officer. During this conversation, Dr. O'Connor told this officer that Beatty had confessed to Christie's murder while speaking with him. Because this conversation happened in the middle of a courthouse, and with an officer, no less, it didn't take long for the prosecution to hear about it. They asked O'Connor to testify to what he'd been told, 
and he refused on the basis of doctor-patient confidentiality. Undeterred, the prosecution subpoenaed Dr. O'Connor and forced him to the stand. If you aren't familiar with subpoenas, they're a type of court order. They're a legal command to appear in court or face legal consequences. Unless giving testimony would infringe upon your right not to self-incriminate, the subpoena requires the receiver to give testimony in court. There's another type of subpoena that requires the receiver to bring physical evidence, like a document, but that's not relevant in this case. It suffices to say that O'Connor was forced under threat of legal action to testify against Beatty. During his time at the Maricopa County Jail, Donald Beatty was considered a high-risk inmate. They thought he might hurt himself because he appeared to be very distressed. So he was seen by Dr. O'Connor, a psychiatrist. Though O'Connor deemed Beatty not to be seriously mentally ill, he still had Beatty moved to the Durango Psychiatric Unit of the jail. This was for a few reasons. Beatty had begun a hunger strike, and they wanted to improve his mental health and stop that. He was also at risk of getting the shit beat out of him in the jail's general population, which I give a hearty shrug to. The last reason had to do with a foot injury that Beatty had sustained. Beatty was given orthopedic surgery to treat his foot, and O'Connor felt like Durango was the better place to recover from the surgery, because there was a yard he could exercise in. Whenever anyone talks about the next part of this case in articles and the like, they always say that Beatty was in group therapy, but that's not true. I went on a deep dive and read all of the appeals documents that I could find, and one of them actually describes this group and why it was formed. In Dr. O'Connor's own words, In the jail, most of the male inmates tend to become extremely lax in their attitudes, especially their behavior when they are around female staff members, personnel, and other female inmates that they may meet going back and forth to court. They can get quite vulgar and profane. It was our hope to experiment and see if we brought them into a closer proximity, closer contact, that they could then start to have a feeling that, Indeed, that this was not simply a sex object over there, but a human being, and become more respectful. What we were hoping to show was that the consequence to that type of group activity, there would be a great assemblance of respect and dignity in our unit, and we were hoping to extrapolate that to our entire jail. Basically, male inmates were being jackasses, and they roped the worst offenders into a group, with some poor women to try and teach them to view women as real people. I don't know about you, but that sounds like actual hell. I wouldn't have wanted to be one of the women in that group. Beatty was asked to join this group because he had been displaying adolescent-type behavior towards the female inmates. I feel like this whole situation matters and should be talked about a lot more. He committed a sex crime against a girl, and it seems like behaving in a misogynistic way is a pattern. But in every news article I read, it just said he was in a group session, and didn't specify why or what type of session. Anyway, when Beatty joined this group, he signed an intake form that read the following. I understand that all group communication is confidential, and therefore group business cannot be discussed outside of group. Only in this way can I feel free to express my feelings. So, you can see why Beatty would feel like any disclosures he made would be protected by doctor-patient confidentiality. During one group session, things got heated. Another inmate, a young woman, starred in on Beatty about his crime, and he became visibly agitated. After the group ended, he waited his turn to speak with Dr. O'Connor. When the others had finished their turn speaking with the psychiatrist and left, Beatty blurted out that he wasn't a terrible person and that he hadn't meant to kill Christy Fornoff. He said it was an accident and that he had accidentally smothered Christy while trying to stop her screaming when she heard her mother searching for her nearby. The horrified psychiatrist watched while Beatty punctuated his statements with hand movements. It was decided that Beatty's confession wasn't protected by doctor-patient confidentiality, and Dr. O'Connor was forced to testify to all of this on the stand. 
and it was enough to convince the jury. They all chose to convict him, and on July 24, 1985, he was sentenced to death by lethal injection. After Christie's murder, the Fornoffs moved to Buffalo, New York, but they continued to work in Christie's name. In 1990, they helped to get a Victim's Bill of Rights passed, which enshrined certain rights into law for the victims of violent crime and their families. It came out that the Rock Point Apartments hadn't done a background check on Beatty, which was a huge mistake. If they'd done a proper check, they'd never have hired him. Beatty had two prior convictions on his record. The first was a theft conviction in Tennessee, but the second was a definite red flag. According to at least one source, he'd been convicted in Texas of trying to sell his son. The source for this particular fact was the East Valley Tribune, which has an excellent record for factualness, so I believe it. But I was unable to find more details about this. You'd think it would be better known, given his crime, but I found just one reference. In addition to the attempt to sell his child, Beatty had been fired from two other apartment complexes for activities like window peeping. So that's definitely a red flag, too. The Fornoffs won a lawsuit against the Rock Point Apartments and were given $1.5 million, which they used to buy a retreat in northern Arizona that they named the Christie House in the Pines. It hosts other families whose children have been the victims of violent crimes. The entire home is covered in different art and decorations of butterflies, because Christie adored them. Christie's friends and classmates continue to remember her at all of the landmark events in their lives. They memorialized her at graduation, at their reunions, and at anniversaries. Christie may be gone, but she is far from forgotten. So, who was Donald Edward Beatty? Honestly, I really don't know. He was born on February 7th, 1955 but I couldn't find where he was born. All I know about his family is that he had a brother named Freddy, and possibly a cousin named Donna. But there are very few hard facts anywhere. Beatty's lawyers claim that he had experienced severe physical and sexual abuse in his childhood. They also said that Beatty had received a brain injury at some point in his life. I don't have any details for these claims either. But... I do have a story. On August 18, 1977, just two days after the death of Elvis Presley, 22-year-old Tammy Bader and two other women were struck by a drunk driver outside of Graceland. Tammy had been crossing the street to take a photo when she was hit. Two men ran over to try and help Tammy. One of these men was Don Beatty. A photo was taken showing the two men leaning over her body, and it would run next to an article where Beatty was hailed as a hero who saved Tammy's life. This was a lie. Tammy spent months in the hospital recuperating from her injuries, and during this time, Don Beatty continually harassed her. He called her in the hospital, expecting her to marry him. But Tammy didn't want anything to do with him. She knew that Beatty hadn't saved her life. He'd only put his hand on her knee while she lay there waiting for paramedics. I don't know when he stopped his calls. Probably when she left the hospital and he didn't have her number anymore. Other than this, I really couldn't find any information on Beatty. This is one of those cases where we know more about the victim of a violent crime than the perpetrator, which is honestly as it should be. I'd rather that the world remembered Christy. Just because Donald Beatty was convicted didn't mean his fight was over. He continued appealing, and they were continuously denied. I actually got a lot of information on this case from his appeals. Eventually, his appeals were exhausted, and his 2011 execution date was wrong near. As the day loomed, Those in charge of Arizona executions were in a bit of a pickle. 
Since 1993, those executed in Arizona have received the three-drug protocol. This usually consisted of sodium thiopental, a barbiturate anesthetic, pancuronium, a paralytic, and potassium chloride, which in high doses stops the heart. But the manufacturer of sodium thiopental wasn't manufacturing the drug anymore. Deciding that one anesthetic was as good as another, officials switched out sodium thiopental with pentobarbital and called it a day. Seeing their chance, Beatty's lawyers filed a motion for an emergency stay. Because no one had any idea what would happen with this new drug, they argued that it would be cruel and unusual punishment to use it during his execution. It's required by law to put prisoners to death as painlessly as possible, and using Beatty as the first guinea pig for their new drug could cause him to suffer needlessly. This is obviously just legal wrangling on the defense's part. But the thing is, they're not wrong. If we just count Arizona's botched executions since 2011, there's been four, and three of them happened in 2022. In my opinion, it has less to do with drugs and more to do with a complete failure to get someone competent with inserting IVs, but you could make the argument that Arizona's habit of hopscotching execution drugs doesn't help. Their argument worked, earning them a temporary stay, but the Arizona Supreme Court called a special hearing on the day of the execution, and, after a delay of nine hours, they decided to lift the stay and allow the execution to commence. For his last meal, Beatty had a small shredded beef chimichanga with salsa, sour cream, and guacamole, a double cheeseburger, french fries, Rocky Road ice cream, and two bottles of Diet Pepsi. A prison official contended that Beatty was trying to put himself into a diabetic coma rather than face the needle, but that's just his supposition, really. His choices weren't that much different than a lot of last meals. Beatty's last words were to the Fornoffs and his brother. To the Fornoffs, he said, I just want to say I'm sorry. God'll let you see her again. To his brother, Freddy, I love you. I kept my promise. After this, he mouthed, I'm sorry, and I love you, and was given the injection. 56-year-old Donald Edward Beatty was pronounced dead at 7.38 p.m., May 25, 2011. Christy Ann Fornoff would have been 40. After the execution, the Fornoffs hugged and cried with each other. We're here for many reasons, Carol Fornoff said. Some for closure, some to pray for Mr. Beatty's soul with the hope that he has asked to be forgiven all of us to represent Christy and the love our family shares as we travel the ups and downs of our lives. We would like to thank all of our friends and family who have given us support and love throughout the years. She continued, We just, as a family, are going to be peaceful about this, and we just want you to know that we feel peace right now. We're relieved that he did say that he was sorry to us, added Roger Fornoff. It seemed that at least the foreign offs were able to find some closure. It's hard for me to tell you how much impact this case has had on the Valley. This case concluded over a decade ago, but it's still brought up in the news. Just in the past few weeks, I've been seeing Carol Fornoff commenting on the governor's temporary stay of executions on the news. I know where the Rock Point apartments were, and where the Fornoffs once lived. I know where Christy and her friend Christina used to go roller skating at Roller World. This case is simultaneously personal to me and distant, which is an odd feeling. Current events inspired me to share the story with you, but I'm glad they did. More people should know about this case, because it didn't just change life in Arizona, but in the U.S., Spurred by this and other child attacks, newspaper companies stopped letting children collect money from customers, and eventually, newspaper deliveries would be taken over by adults. This case had world-changing ripples. Even though Christine never got the chance to be a famous model, the whole country felt her loss. Sadly, 
So, this one was a sad one. Have you ever heard of this case before? Let me know. Please like, subscribe, and comment, follow, or whatever the option is for your platform. I have a Patreon, which has a variety of perks. Firstly, there's this name card after YouTube videos, which you can get your name on. Also, I plan to do episode polls and AMAs. And there will be exclusive episodes on the Patreon, like the Unit 731 episode that I'm writing and researching right now. If you can support me monetarily, that's amazing. But even if you can't, you're still a superstar, and I love all of you. Remember, stay safe and stay hydrated. <laughs>